Welcome back, everyone, to a very special episode of the Draw Control Podcast. On today's episode, I am joined by Honor Ashby, who is a player on the England U-20 women's lacrosse team. In the seven games that she played, Honor caused two turnovers. Honor currently plays for the University of Exeter and Blues Lacrosse Club, and we are so excited to have her on the podcast so we can share stories like hers from players from England and different countries. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Honor, and how is everything going? Hi, uh, it's going really well, thank you. Really excited to be on the podcast, chatting about lacrosse. Well, I'm excited to have you on the podcast as well, and uh, I'm glad we got to work out a time to have you on. I'm really excited. So um, let's talk about the beginning of your lacrosse career and sort of work all the way up to where you are today. So from the research I did on yourself, it says that you're from Hopefully I pronounced this correctly, uh, Guildford, Surrey. So talk about growing yeah. up there and how did you start playing lacrosse? Yeah, so I started playing lacrosse when I was 11, when I went to my secondary school. I'd always been very sporty. My dad was really into cycling, so I'd done like cycling. I always did cross country at school. I did triathlon, those sort of sports when I was younger. Then when I went to secondary school, that was where I started playing lacrosse because that was the main team sport that they offered. And that's when I think I discovered that like team sports were definitely the right option for me. I'd always done individual sports growing up, but team sport I definitely thought was the right path for me. Like, And I know that now growing up, that's what I've loved far more. Um, my parents were both quite sporty, encouraged me to get into sports when I was younger. And I think that sort of ethic of them them doing sports, being very like hardworking. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay yeah so growing up with them them playing sport and like being very hardworking people encouraged me to do that sort of route so yeah that's where I started and I've been playing it ever since now who are some of your lacrosse role models growing up in England yeah so I had a really good culture of strong lacrosse players at the school that I went to St Catherine's school um and who provided really good role models for me when I was growing up so within the lacrosse world, I looked up to Sophie Tamblin, who was our manager at the World Cup. She used to play for England under 19 when I was really young at the school and she was older. So she was definitely someone I looked up to. I was coached by Emily Gray, who um, is one of England's most capped international players. And she was very inspirational for me. And having been coached by her since like the age of 12, that's been such a big part for me in my lacrosse journey, having her um teach me other players are like Laura Merrifield are very inspirational um she worked at a school near near mine and so we'd see her for like Saturday matches and things like that so yeah she was definitely a big inspiration to me growing up when I was like a little bit older when I started watching like NCAA lacrosse role models for me like from America definitely I'd say like the UNC like 2022 season players like Ali Mastriani and Emily Knowles who is now an England player yeah, they were definitely people who I looked up to and were very inspirational for me. That's awesome. Now let's talk about your university experience. So you currently yeah. play for the University of Exeter. In England, is there like a recruiting process for when an athlete joins a university? And if so, how did you end up going how did you end up going to the University of Exeter? And if not, how did you start playing the cross there? What was that sort of process like for you? Yeah, so it is very different, I think, to the US process of recruiting. I know, so my coach at university, Mike, comes from the American system, and he's always shocked when we um, say that. So in England, when we find we find out what uni we're going to about a month before we go, and that's like so different to America. But you choose a firm and insurance university depending on which ones you want, like you want to go to. And for me, I always want to prioritize the lacrosse. Um, so that was why I chose Exeter because I knew I'd get the best level of coaching, really strong teammates to play with. So that was why I chose Exeter. Um, it's a less rigorous process, but I was always in communication with Mike, who's our coach at Exeter. Um, we had like a national schools tournament towards the end of my last year of secondary school where I met with him and he encouraged me to come to Exeter. Uh, and from then on, it was nailed on for me. It was somewhere I really wanted to go to. So yeah, that was that was my sort of process into doing it. It was always in my mind. Um, but yeah, that decided it for me. 
That's crazy that you guys don't know where you're going until a month before. I think that would make me very stressed out. Usually here in America, you finally know where you're going like five or six months out just so you can have time Yeah. to sort of move in and plan all that stuff out. Yeah, it's mad. It's a really quick turnaround. You 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 hopefully have an idea because it all depends on when you get your grades and if you've got the grades for the university you're going to. But you've sort of got an idea of the one or two you might be going to. But yeah, only within like a week or so if you've got preseason. Yeah. Nice, nice. Wow, that's that's definitely It's mad. interesting. That's for sure. So Yeah. now you also play for the Blues Lacrosse Club. So for those who don't know, describe what your lacrosse team is like at Blues and who are some of the players you get to play with, who coaches you, and like who are some of the teams that you play against on a daily basis. Yeah, so I started Blues when I went into sixth form, so my last two years of secondary school. Uh, it's a really, really friendly club. I knew a lot of girls who played for Blues or some of my some of my coaches played for Blues, which really encouraged me to join that club. Um, we're a player coach club, so our captains coach our players on, when we have training on Tuesdays. Um, but it's a really good environment for fostering like young school-level athletes through playing with older international athletes. And that really helps accelerate your skill level, I'd say, when you're at school and you're aspiring to play internationally. So for me personally, like I played at Blues with England internationals like Claire Farham, Emily Chandler, and they were brilliant at encouraging, um, increasing your skill level because you're playing with them so regularly at such a faster, like stronger, high level compared to what you're playing at school. So I think that's why... joining a club is so beneficial in England. But I also was playing with England teammates who I went to the World Cup with, like Annie Mather and Izzy Middleton. And that's another thing I'd say, when we get on to talking about the World Cup maybe later, like playing with these sort of people every week really, really benefited when it comes to playing with them on the international stage. Yeah. And then we played against other UK clubs like Centaurs and Hawks. Um, and we were... happy to be made European champions in 2022 and 2023. And we came third place this year. So yeah, a very successful club in the UK. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on those finishes. Obviously, Yeah. you hope to do better than third place, though, I would imagine, uh, for the upcoming year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's been your favorite memory with both those teams so far? Um. So for Exeter, I'd say... Probably my pre-season training in my first year as a fresher at university, like getting to know the team, getting to know my club coach. I really loved those few weeks. Um, and this is quite a controversial one. My teammates would probably not agree with me. But um, last year, with our, we lost to Durham, which is one of the other universities in the semifinals. But although some people might have said that was not one of their favourite moments, it was such a high level of play, um, which we hadn't faced so far really in the season. We lost eight, nine to them, I'm pretty sure, in golden goal. So like, but it was such a tight, well-fought match with two really good teams. Like for me, that was definitely a highlight. And then just like generally spending time with my teammates. Um, in the lead up to the World Cup, we trained a lot in the summer with a lot of my teammates, like Alice Ripper, Annie Mather. That was really useful for me. So just those like sessions, the day in, day out, basically, I loved. And then for Blues, I'd say like any Sunday night lights matches against other teams, like that's the sort of environment I really enjoy playing in. Um, yeah, those would, that's what I'd say would be my highlight personally. Now, you sort of mentioned it in your previous answer, but how have Blues, Lacrosse Club, and the University of Exeter sort of helped prepare you for the U20 World Championships? Yeah, so they've been both so influential in my development as a player I'd say so at Blues I, I mentioned it like you said before but like I would definitely say it helped me considerably when I was at school so as I as I've been at university I've definitely I haven't had as much time to play with my club but in that progression from school to university level when I was first at when I was at school first starting to play for the England under 20 setup it definitely helped me get used to the level of international play at a, lot quicker rate so yeah that's what Blues has really helped me do for sure um, and just the support of players um, from Blues during the World Cup was really really helpful um, I was messaging Laura Beanan who's one of our players at Blues during the World Cup and she was really really helpful just like chatting stuff through so yeah I'd say that is it's sort of a family which um, really helps you out and then at Exeter so much helped me prepare for the World Cup 
the training sessions were so invaluable for helping me develop as a player. Mike's been a phenomenal coach, helping me work on everything that I need to work on. I needed to work on uh, in the build-up. So I had like a game plan with him of what I wanted to improve on. And we had sessions where like one-on-one -on -one sessions, team training sessions, just the little day in, day out um, things to work on. That's really what X to help me. Um, and it was a mix of the high level coaching, the teammates who I was playing in with, and the SNC that was available to me at X. So just all those things helped me become a school level player to an international player, I would say. Yeah. Now let's transition and talk about those U20 World Championships that took place last month. I'm just curious, how does the selection process work for Team England? And where were you when you found out you were going to Hong Kong? Yeah, so for me, my England process started when I was quite young at like a regional level. And then when I was a bit older, after lockdown sort of time, I went into the national program and then into the under 20 program. Um, and then coming off the back of the European Championships, which were July 2023, we had training sessions monthly, if not more frequently. Um, and that was where the process really began of deciding players for the World Cup. So we took a tour to Florida in preparation for the World Cup in February this year. And then after that point, uh, there was a player cup before home ints, which is a tournament we play against like Scotland, Wales, um, any other teams which want to come over to the tournament. Um, and then after that, the decision was made, final selection for the World Cup was made, I'd say like four or five months out. Um, and then after that process, after that, we had ramped up level of training sessions in the lead up to the World Cup. Um, and then where was I when I found out? Honestly, quite boring. I was just at home. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like to be on my own for these sort of things. Like I didn't want to be around other people. So yeah, I just was finding out on my own. But yeah, I definitely remember where I was. <laughs> quite <Yeah>. boring. <laughs> Well, after talking to some of your teammates uh, for this podcast, a lot of them were in the same place that you were where you yeah. found out. So it seems to be a theme with your team, I would imagine. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, what was your experience like in Hong Kong just off the field? I would imagine that was probably your first time ever visiting there. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is um something I often think about. Like I mentioned just briefly before that we took a tour to Florida in February, but the amount of like opportunities and experiences I've gained from playing lacrosse are incredible I would have never have probably gone to Hong Kong or Florida had I not been playing lacrosse so yeah it's a real moment when you're out in these places and experiencing these experiences of real pinch me moment of wow like I'm here from the sport I played which is really exciting it was a very very um interesting place to be it was very busy very we went to we went on quite a few before the tournament started to settle in like a climatization uh, process. We looked around the city, which was really incredible. Um, it's honestly an uh, experience which I will remember forever. Yeah. Um, and my whole family was out there. So my mom, my dad and my sister, which was nice. So I got to see them a couple of times away from the matches and being with the team, which was really good because I think you need moments like that to get away from just like the busyness of the tournament and ground yourself. So yeah, that really made a difference for me. Now it's from an individual perspective, what would you say is the biggest improvement you made throughout the tournament? Um, So from an individual perspective, I would genuinely say the this very like basic answer, but like getting used to the conditions of a new country, I think, I really improved on as I went through the tournament. I think you you probably know that the humidity and the heat of Hong Kong in August was ridiculous, and like nothing I've ever experienced before I'd been there. And like, although I was, we were all very aware of this and prepared for this, um, I'd say like my ability to cope with that definitely got better throughout the tournament. I got used to like managing the heat and how to get through that, that um, particularly because it was so hot that um, sometimes made you feel quite nauseous and like managing my food intake and things like that was things you definitely need to focus on as an athlete. And like they are accelerated when the temperature is very high. So yeah, I think it was like learning about me as an athlete and like how I needed to cope with that. I got better at throughout the tournament, which is really good and something I hope to take with me in the future. Yeah. Yeah. 
probably a complete 180 from the climate in England. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very different for sure. <laughs> Now let's talk about your team's performance just overall in the tournament. So um, in group play, your team played very well, winning three out of four games. What would you say was your team's key to success in the group stage? I think we really stuck together as a team and we just had a lot of fun. And I think that made a really big difference when we were playing teams like Jamaica and Hong Kong in the group matches. We were confident with our game plan and that led to us dominating those matches, which was really good. And I'd say my favourite match of the whole tournament actually was when we played Ireland in the group stages and beat them because we were in quite a precarious position having lost to Japan just before. Um, so we needed to win Ireland and we we needed to win the match against Ireland and we needed to win by a margin of, I think it was three goals, which ended up being five, but it was three initially. And honestly, that's my best memory I've taken from the World Cup because we just pulled together as a team and there was one option to get us through to the knockouts and we took that option and we took it convincingly. So, yeah, I'd say just honestly, our work as a team really, really got us through that. Yeah. yeah. Well, your team unfortunately then lost to Japan, which ended your team's chances at winning a medal. What made Japan such a good opponent from your perspective as a defender? And what did you take away from that loss? Because I talking to other players who play in this tournament they were just raving about how good the Japanese defense was and just how different it was compared to other teams that they saw throughout the tournament yeah I would say that is definitely as you just mentioned that has definitely been a major takeaway for the world of lacrosse as a whole how strong Japan were at this tournament and how promising that is for their nation in the future I have so much respect for them like we played them twice and they were very very strong both times they were very very fast had very accurate stick work they were well drilled as a team i'd say particularly on the draw they knew exactly what they were doing and they executed it every time and they knew when they were subbing just little thick details like that really really were what i thought made them such a strong team and even off the pitch they were so humble so polite um yeah when we were watching the final when we were watching USA Canada, we were sat very close to the Japanese players and yeah, they were just lovely to be around. But on the pitch, I would say it would be their accuracy and their well-drilled nature. You could tell they were such a cohesive unit. So yeah, taking away from the matches, I'd say, because obviously we played them twice, we played them once in the group and then second time in the knockout. And unfortunately we lost both times. However, I'd say taking away from match one, there was a considerable improvement in our play against them which was really promising. Um, we stuck to a more, uh, uh, we pressed out more in defence. We stuck to a more dictating defence in the second match. And I think that played to our advantage. So yeah, I think that's something we can take away from the tournament that is that we improved between those two matches. It would have been unfortunate to have dropped off between the two matches, but to play them a second time and take away that, yes, personally, we felt we'd improved was really promising. Now, you ended the tournament by beating Italy and then losing to Puerto Rico. Talk about those games from your perspective as a defender, and what did your team learn from those games as well? Obviously, you probably want to end the tournament off on a high note, but is there any sort of thing you can take away from the game against Puerto Rico that you can sort of take with you, I guess, with Blues and Exeter now? Yeah, for sure. So the Italy match, um, we had to bring the energy because we just come off a loss. And obviously, when you go into a tournament, wanting to do well, wanting to reach your goals and then coming off a loss in the group stages, that's a hard place to be in. But I think it was really important that across the pitch, we brought the energy. We respected our teammate, but we brought the energy. and oh, Not our teammate, our opposition, but we brought the vibes, we brought the energy, brought the positivity. And I think that really showed on the pitch. We we beat Italy very convincingly um, when we could have, you, you could see teams in that situation really slack off and we didn't. Um, so I'm proud of how we stepped up in that match. Puerto Rico, we got off to quite a difficult start. We um, lost a considerable number of draw controls in the first 10 minutes and went down as a result very quickly. However, something I take away from that match is that how you can change momentum within a match, even when things are not going your way. Um, and I really thought we showed that as a team. To go 5-0 in the first, five nil down in the first quarter straight away and then... I think after that point, I remember it was that we lost 
no, after the five nil down, we we I think we scored thirteen to their eleven. So although we lost the match, that is quite a convincing turnaround. And I think to stick together as a unit and show real belief that we could execute a comeback, which I'd say the majority of us believe we could still do right until the dying moments of the game, is really impressive. Um, so yeah, I believe we left everything out there, and there are still positives to take from that match. Although, as you are right, would have been lovely to end on a win. <laughs> yeah. What was it like being coached by Vicky Alexander and the rest of the coaching staff um, in the tournament? Yeah, so the coaching staff, I think one of the key aspects of them was they knew us They knew us all so well. And I really think that showed as a team. Um, I've, I've been coached by Vicky Alexander, luckily, since I was like really um, young at school. Connor Dockerty, he was our attacking coach. He'd coached me when I was at regional academy. And this is the same for so many players in the squad. Like we knew the coaches very well and that was a real benefit to us. Um, so we're very familiar with their coaching styles and personalities, which is very useful in um, an international tournament when everything's changing around you to at least know that's a constant. Um, we had international experience as well from Emma Adams, who um, very recently has come off playing for England Senior Women's. And that was really useful for us as a squad to have someone to relate to on the staff who has been through what we've been through. So yeah, there were great, great coaching staff. Georgie Hurt as well. And obviously we had um, S&C and Physio, Rich and Ed, who were brilliant too. Now talk about what was like getting the chance to play with other great defenders like Gemma Thompson and Lois Krillian. Did you learn anything from just by being their teammate? And it's probably going to be cool now that you get to be Gemma's teammate um, yeah. at university as well. Yeah, no, it's crazy. We have we had six defenders in our squad at the World Cup and four of us are from Exeter, <laughs> which is really exciting for the season ahead. So yeah, really nice to be playing with them still. Um, it's been brilliant playing with them. I get along with all of them so well. Gemma is one of my best friends out of lacrosse too. Like, um, she always comes and stays with me whenever we have squad weekends and that has really like made us super close as friends. So that was great to be able to transfer how well we know each other off the pitch onto the pitch. I've got great respect for all five of my teammates in the defence. They were all brilliant. Um, Anna was one of our captains. She was a great leader. She really brought the morale when things were going tough. Uh, Grace Davison, I played with her at school since I was pretty young like 14 15 we know each other really well and that again it's this knowing each other really well off the pitch which I think really uh transfers when you're playing together and then like I said Lois and Ash who are the defenders are also playing at Exeter that this year so I'm really exciting to carry on that knowledge we have of each other to university yeah now what will you take away from your experience at the U20 World Championships overall looking back on it now a month later yeah, so looking back on it, um, it's obviously going to be memories, which I'm going to keep with me forever. It was a phenomenal experience. And like I said, taking those high moments of like when we beat Ireland or even the low moments when you can remember and remember pulling through in a time you found really hard, I think are experiences that like will really benefit you in the long run. I learned so much more about myself, like on a very basic level of like, what I, what I needed to eat, when I needed to sleep, when I needed to relax, when I needed to be with other people. But then on like a, I learned on a deeper level, like a lot about myself during the matches. So yeah, that is definitely what I think I'll take with me. And then in addition to that, it's just, I know it sounds really cliched, but the friendships, like I've known most of the people on my team since I was like 12. I think the thing with English lacrosse is everyone knows everyone really well because you play against each other week in, week out at club, at school. And then if you're at international, in a, in an international program at those two. And I just think that has been one of the best things for me about playing at, for England is the friendships I've got from it. They really are invaluable and I genuinely mean that. So yeah, that's what I take away from it. Yeah. Now I do want to ask you this. So what do you think should be done to help continue to grow women's lacrosse in England? As you mentioned, you probably know everyone that is in the <laughs> English lacrosse, but uh, do you think there's any way that the country can do anything that the country can do that can make lacrosse grow even more and sort of have more players uh, play the sport? Yeah, I mean, I imagine you'll get this answer from pretty much anyone you ask it to, but I would genuinely say funding. 
And I, I know that's, again, like I said, you probably hear that, but it just would make such a huge difference to the sport. So many people love lacrosse when they play it. I'm like, it's such a big part of our lives, but to have um, some form of funding would be incredible because that is the hardest thing to juggle is um, managing yourself like you are an elite athlete, but it's all coming from your own funding. Um, and we were very lucky. Like I take the World Cup, for example, we had an incredible parent group Shout out to like Diana Can, Kath Mather, Vicky Bell on the fundraising team who helped us to get to the World Cup. But to have that funded centrally would be incredible. Yeah. No, that's what I've heard a lot from players from your yeah. team. It's, it's the, I find it crazy that players from even the senior team have to do that funding yeah. stuff as well. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that can, I guess, get changed a little bit because um, I feel like that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, but yeah. unfortunately it is so yeah. um, but I'm glad that people stepped up and helped you guys get to Hong Kong yeah no for sure so let's move on to a segment I like to call the non-lacrosse segment where I ask you some non-lacrosse questions to get to know you more off the field and we'll have a fun conversation with this because I'll give you some of my answers as well so <laughs> the first one is obviously I can't answer these two but first one is uh, who is the funniest teammate on the England lacrosse team Okay, my funniest teammate, I would say, has to be Ellie Martin or Grace Davison. They were both hilarious. Get along with them really, really well. So, yeah, those are my two shout-outs. <laughs> Which teammate has the best style off the field? Best style? I'd have to say Grace again or Rachel, Rachel Ball. They're both very stylish people. I, I, I like a lot of the outfits. I often go up to them and have to ask them where they're from. So, yeah, those two. <laughs> Now, obviously, you went to Hong Kong for the first time last month. Where is one place you would love to travel to one day? I would love to go to Australia or New Zealand for sure. That would definitely be top of my bucket list. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. I would love to go there as well, but that flight just scares me. Yeah. I don't know if I can do a 16-hour flight. So no, there's so part of fair. me that's like, I might just enjoy it from YouTube, and that might be it just because, <laughs> I don't know, that, that flight's a long, that's a long, long flight. Yeah. Hong Kong was the furthest I'd ever gone on a plane so far, and that was a long way. So, yeah, you're right. It's a long it's a long flight to Australia. <laughs> I would say for me, probably um, just the West Coast of the United States, like California, Nevada, Arizona. Uh, just it would be cool to, like, see all the national parks that are there and sort of just explore that part of the United States. Yeah, nice. Now... What is, speaking of the United States, what is one question that you have for Americans in general? So I actually asked this to, to my car coach the other day because he's he's American. But I would, my question would be, what state do you think would be, is the most underrated to go and visit? Oh, that's a good one. Mm. I would say from, I haven't visited every, every state. So, so my answer is probably not as good as maybe someone else's <laughs> that has been to everywhere. But I would say probably like, Maryland. Maryland's not that yeah. bad. It was kind of cool when I went there and it's near D Washington, D.C. And uh, I don't know, Maryland was pretty cool. I also enjoyed Washington State as well, um, just nice. because uh, Seattle, when we visited there, was a really nice city and had a lot of fun stuff to do there. So I'd say uh, Washington or Maryland is two pretty underrated uh, states to visit here in the U.S. that I would assume a lot of people like internationally probably don't consider visiting when they come here. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I would say for my question for you is I have a few. One is what soccer team do you support? Because I find it wow. super interesting to see which teams that people support or clubs, I should say, that people support yeah, in yeah. England. So I support Manchester United. And that I definitely say is through my family. Yeah. My family support my dad supports Manchester United. So that that's my team I support. Yeah. That's awesome. That's <laughs> good awesome. question though. David yeah. Beckham, big, big, a big fan of his. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. awesome. And then the other question I had for you is obviously here in the U S you know, we really admire the British accent. What do people from England think about American accents when we visit to England? Oh gosh. I don't, I, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I, <laughs> Uh, I uh, obviously like what I was saying like my coach is American we've got a few Americans this year in our team so I think we're pretty used to it here in okay. the UK yeah okay. and also so many of our films music is American so yeah 
I guess that makes sense. I guess that makes yeah. sense. Because, like, here we have this thing called, like, Brit Box. Uh, we get an advertisement <laughs> where you can watch, like, British TV shows, and it's, like, a really popular thing. Yeah. And then maybe it's because, like, most people that I ever talk to have an American accent. Yeah. So you don't really see that many people with an English accent, like, where yeah, you no. live. So that's probably why it's probably a little more, maybe it's more common to hear other accents in England than yeah. it is here in the U.S. Yeah. Whereas for us, I think American accent is pretty normal. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. Now, speaking of sort of similar question that you asked me, but what is your favorite part mm -hmm. of England? Like if someone's going there for the first time, like where would you recommend uh, them to visit? So I would definitely say somewhere coastal. So I, we, when we were younger, often went to Norfolk. So North Norfolk coast is beautiful. Or I would say Devon. So Exeter's in Devon. And then say like that is just a beautiful part of the world to go to. I'm very lucky at university that we've got like countryside and beach like so close by. So yeah, those would be my two recommendations. Now, if you could have lunch with anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Oh, I'm gonna be really generic, and I'm sure you get this a lot, but I'd say Usain Bolt. Someone also or, gave me that too. <laughs> yeah. Or Harry Styles. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good. Very answer. basic, but yeah. I feel like I would want to hear about Harry Styles like fashion. I feel like he would help me out yeah. a little bit because I feel like he's very out there with his fashion, which I kind of appreciated because it definitely, yeah. um, I don't know. I think it's pretty good, but I probably couldn't afford yeah. any of the stuff he wears. It's probably, <laughs> it's probably like a hundred thousand dollars or something crazy yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I would say for me, so normally for this question, I give out the same answer and I want to be different every time I interview someone else. So I decided to put a caveat and say someone from the UK to talk to. So I'd say Paul McCartney. I think okay. it'd be really interesting to talk to him just because he has so much, he's experienced so much life, but just to hear about how he wrote all those songs with the Beatles would be pretty awesome to listen to, especially since that's one of my favorite bands of all time. So I'd go with him. Yeah, no, good answer for sure. Now, getting, I guess one more question I want to ask you, Honor, before we end the interview is, do you have any shout outs you want to give and who should on, who on the team, who f should we have next on the podcast? Okay, so just shout outs in general to all of my teammates on the under 20s. Yeah, just love them all. And I'd say on that note, someone to interview next is I'd say we had three players on our team who juggle were juggling um shift work and um, placement work in the preparation for the World Cup. So Anna Green was doing physio. Lucy Evans was doing midwifery and Emma Pierce is studying to be a, a medic. So I'd say one of them would be really good to interview because obviously their preparations for the World Cup was very different to the rest of ours. So yeah, that would be my recommendation. That's awesome. We'll definitely reach out and see what they have to say. But yeah, um, <laughs> Honor, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. Oh, it was so much fun getting the chance to meet with you, to have this conversation and learn more about your lacrosse career in England. I had a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, I wish you all the best uh, with your future uh, endeavors and with Exeter. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. This was super fun to do. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I had a great time.